but you can travel throughout all the three worlds and you personally know Lord Brahma, Lord Vishnu and Mahadeva. He says, tell me, out of the three of them, who shall I go to to help me out? So Narada, he smiles and he says, oh Vrata, he says, you know, who is easiest pleased? Who is it? Lord Shiva. He said, Lord Mahadeva, he is the easiest pleased. He said, but beware, he is also the easiest angered. He says, Mahadeva grants boons to anybody who comes to him with sincerity, comes to him with determination. And he says, even good demands, like Banasura and Ravana, even good ones, not only weak ones, but even powerful demands, like Ravana and Banasura, they have gone to Mahadeva because of whom they have become so very powerful. And he said they got exactly what they required. So Ravana and Banasur went to Mahadeva and they got exactly what they required. So Narada, he is infusing a little message here for Bakrasur. If you pursue this path of Asuric qualities, if you pursue this path of becoming the best demon, you will meet an end not different from Ravana and Banasur. And so Bakrasu, that message is lost on him. And so he proceeds where the Kedarnath. He says, I am going to the place where I know Mahadeva will come. And so he goes to Kedarnath and he began to perform the Pasya. Om Namah Shivai, Om Namah Shivai, Om Namah Shivai. Bakrasu, he is meditating on this form of Lord Shiva. And it is said that many, many years passed, 100 years passed, 500 years passed, and Bakrasur is wondering, is Lord Shiva not pleased with my devotion? And so he starts to intensify this tapasya. He starts to intensify it until after 1,000 years have passed, Lord Shiva, he appears. And Lord Shiva, he looks at Bakrasur and he says, my child, Lord Shiva is looking at this demon who wants to be the greatest demon. And he says, my child, why? Lord Shiva Bhagavan, he accepts everybody. He accepts the prayers of everyone. So he says, my child, what do you want? So Vakrasu, he says, oh Mahadeva, I want immortality. The demon thing to do is to ask for immortality. And so he says, oh Lord, I wish for immortality. Imagine you're meditating for 1,000 years and Mahadeva finally appears. What will you ask for? When Bhagavan appeared in front of Nandi, Nandi said, I forget everything that I want. I only want you. When Bhagavan appeared in front of Dhruva, Dhruva said, I forget everything. All I want is you. When Bhagavan appeared in front of Prahalad, when Prahalad said, Lord, why are you asking me to ask for something? You're trying to trick me. All I want is you. But this demon, this is the difference between a devotee and a asura. This demon, he is very intent on what he wants. And so he says, I wish for immortality. And so Bhagavan Shiva, what does he say? Can we give you immortality? Why? For anyone who has been born, they must die. Ask for something else. Whatever else you wish for. I will give this to you. And so, Bakrasu, he thinks, and he says, aha, I know what it is I want. He says, my Lord, may death come to anyone on whose head I please my hand. May death come to anyone on whose head I please my hand. May they be burnt to ashes. So that's a strange thing to ask for, right? Like that would definitely not be my second wish. <laughs> but for Vakra Asur, we start seeing the reasoning or the truth behind the intention for his tapasya. He doesn't ask for protection for himself. He doesn't ask for power. He doesn't ask for prosperity. 
He asks for the ability to destroy other people. Typically, when somebody places their hand on our head, what is that a symbol of? It's a symbol of blessing or it's a gesture of affection. Right? If you put your hands on somebody here, it's a gesture of affection. And only those close to us, both physically and emotionally, will receive this benediction, right? We not just go to a stranger and start touching their head. People who are close to us will offer this blessing or will offer this affection. Vakrasur, he doesn't, he, he's not thinking this through. And so, obviously, he is not a people person. He wants the social distance. He wants to keep everybody at least an arm's length away, right? Because if you cross that personal space, then you're at risk of being destroyed by him. And so, this desire to harm people, it represents the inability to have healthy relationships. Signs of toxic behavior. So now she goes, you sure that's what you want? Like a thousand years, you did some passion and that's, you sure that's what you're asking for? And so he says, absolutely no, that is what I want. And so Lord Shiva, he says, that I ask you, so be it. And from today onwards, you will now be known as Bhasmasur. Many of us have heard this katha before. You will be known as Bhasmasur. Bhasma meaning ashes, and Asura is a demon. Bhasmasur can have two meanings. The first is the demon who can turn something into ashes or the demon of ashes. Two meanings, right? So Bhasma Asur, he is very, very happy that Lord Shiva has given him this very unique gift, or so he thinks, this very, very unique gift. And he becomes intoxicated with his newfound power. He now thinks, look at me. Look at how much power I have in my hands, literally. Literally, I have this power in my hands. I can turn any being into ashes. Now, all beings will fear me. I will become the most powerful being ever. And so he starts to think in this way. He looks at Bhagavan Shiva and he starts to laugh. Ha ha ha, we know these demons laugh, right? This, he starts to laugh because a light bulb has gone off in his head. He is thinking, if I can turn Shiva into ashes, then there is nobody who can compete with me. Now Bhasma Asur has forgotten that he has gotten his power from Lord Shiva. He has forgotten that Lord Shiva is the source of his power. Now if we cut our power at its source, what is going to happen? We will be in darkness. We will lose our power. But when the ego gets so big, we lose good sense. And this is, this is what is happening with Bhasma Asur. His ego is becoming so big with the potential of his power that he has forgotten who is the source of his power. And so he looks at Bhagavan Shiva and he starts to laugh. And Bhagavan Shiva, he immediately knows what Bhasma Asur's intentions are. And he begins to run. He begins to run. And Bhasma Asur, he begins to chase Lord Shiva with his hands outstretched with the intention of placing his hand on Bhagavan Shiva's head. The entire world is trying to touch Bhagavan's feet. But this ego-ridden demon wants to touch Bhagavan's head in his arrogance. So Bhagavan Shiva, he begins to run. Now the question is, why does Bhagavan Shiva run? Why does he run? Many times when we, times when we hear this katha, we hear Bhagavan Shiva becomes afraid. And so because of that, now he is, fear, he is afraid for his safety. And he begins to run. Does Bhagavan Shiva get scared? Bhagavan Shiva is Advitiya, one without the second, Akal, beyond time, Nirabhaya, without fear. Bhaya is fear, Nirabhaya. He's Nirabhaya without fear. Can anybody make him afraid? Bhagavan Shiva just has to open his third eye and he will burn Pasmasuruta ashes. 
He does it. Basnasur has not asked for protection. Remember, he has asked just for this ability to hurt others. So Bhagavan Shiva, he's done it before. He can open his third eye just like he did with Kama, Manmata, and he can burn him to ashes. He doesn't even have to go arms or anything. So Basmasur. So why would Lord Shiva be afraid of him? And so Lord Shiva, he is running. The question is why? In our Puranas, there are two famous leaders of the Lord running, being pursued by a jiva or an embodied soul. Two examples. The first is Basmasur, chasing Bhagavan Shiva. The second is who? One day Maya Yashoda is sitting churning butter. And as she is churning butter, you know, a lot of times in our Puranas, this idea of churning, churning butter, churning the ocean, it represents the mind. This mind that is constantly churning. There's constant thoughts going through our mind. Right now we're sitting here, but our mind probably is at home. Or our mind is with somebody else, or it's not here. This mind is constantly churning. And Maya Yashoda, she is sitting and she is churning this butter. And little Lala Bhagavan Krishna, who is two years old, he is looking at his mother and he is saying, but look at this lady. This lady performed so many years of tapasya to have me come as her son. And I am right here. And she is chilling with her. She is supposed to be paying attention to me. So he goes up to her and he sits on her lap. And he says, Ma, I am hungry. Bhagavan Krishna's intention is to capture the attention of his devotees, to capture the attention of his mother. And so Mahesha said, okay, Krishna, just now she continues churning this butter. And Bhagavan says, no, no, Maya. And you know, sometimes when little children sit in our lap and they want attention, they would pull our face <laughs> so that we look at them. And so he does that. He pulls Mahesha and says, no, Maya, no, I'm hungry. And so Mahesha, she says, okay, Lala. She gathers him up in her arms and she goes and she sits below a tree. And she begins to nurse him. And so Bhagavan Krishna, he is very happy. Because now he has his mother's complete attention. While she is nursing him, something happens. She has a pot on the stove. And this pot begins to spill over. And you know you hear the sound, right? When you have rice in the pot and the water starts to flow over, you hear, shh. So she starts to hear the sound of her pot spilling over. Many times symbolically, we have Bhagavan in front of us. We are sitting doing puja, we are doing sanya, we do doing upasana, and our mind goes to whatever is spilling over in our life. And so Maya Yashoda, she takes Krishna and she places him on the ground. And she goes to take care of the busyness of the world. She puts down Bhagavan and she goes to take care of the busyness of the world. And Bhagavan Krishna, he's not happy. He is not happy. And so what does he do, this two-year-old child? He takes a stone as big as he could hold. And he throws it at the pot that Maya Yashoda has this butter in that she is chin. And with his little, little hands, he scoops up as much butter as he can. And he runs behind one of the bull carts. Remember, they are farmers. He runs behind one of the bull carts and he sits down and he starts to feed the monkeys. He starts to feed the monkeys. Beautiful Lila of Bhagavan Krishna. Maya Yashoda, she eventually comes outside and she sees this mess, the broken pot, the butter scattered, and she begins to watch as little footsteps of butter are leading her to this tree. And she says, oh, I know, my Lala has done this. And so she smiles because how can you not? The beauty of the nutcut Bhagavan Krishna. She smiles, but she goes because she knows that she must discipline little Krishna. And so we know the beautiful Damodar Lila, where Maya Yashoda, she reaches upon Bhagavan Krishna and she says, Lala, have you broken my pot? No, Maya, I didn't break your pot. Lala, who broke my pot? Maya, look at my hands. My hands are small. I can't break your pot. And so 
We know the beautiful Leela. Maya Yashoda began to chase little Krishna. This is the second, or maybe for me it's the primary, famous Leela of a Jiva, Maya Yashoda, chasing Bhagavan. Chasing after him literally. And Bhagavan Krishna, he starts to run. And he, because he is tiny, he's dashing in and out between the wheels of the bull car. He is going under things, he's going above things. And Maya Yashoda, in her old age, remember Krishna came to Maya in her old age. She is having a difficult time catching up with this little baby. And so, finally, Bhagavan Krishna he turns around and he thinks Maya has had enough. What is his intention? To make Maya love him more. To make Maya think about him more. To make us who are hearing about this Leela love him more. To make us think about him more. And so eventually he says, okay, okay, let me allow her to catch me. And so we know that he slows down when Yeshuda catches him. She says, today is the day you're going to get punished. And we know she goes and she gathers rope and she tries to tie him. And every time she tries to tie him, the rope is two inches too short. And she will tie the rope to another piece of rope. And every time she tries to tie him, she is, it is two inches too short. Until finally, what is the lesson Bhagavan is saying? Nobody can tie me without my consent. Nobody can control my actions without my consent. Finally, in the name of love for his mother, he allows her to tie him. Shri Krishna Chandra Bihari Lal Ki Jai. So, famous example, Jiva is chasing after Bhagavan. Here in Akata tonight, this Jiva is also chasing Bhagavan Shiva. Why is Bhagavan Shiva running? In Dhammudar Lina, he is running for the pleasure of Maya Yashoda. He is running to increase this Vatsalya Bhav, this Bhava's of mother and child. Because remember, Maya too has performed tapasya to come and enjoy this moment with Krishna as her child to give her the pleasure of being a mother. The Lord runs as though he is afraid. As though he is afraid. And so, in Bhasma Asur's case too, he has come to the Lord as the Lord's destroyer. He has come to the Lord as the Lord's destroyer. In Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavan Krishna says, repeat after me, Ye yatha, Ye yatha Maam, maam Prapadyanti Tamstathaiva Bhajamyaham Mama Vartsman Vartanti Manushyaha Partha, Sarvashaha. So, Bhasma Surin, he too has performed tapasya. He too has come to Bhagavan, Krishna, Bhagavan Shiva. Bhagavan Krishna tells us in Bhagavad Gita, in whatever way people come to me, in whatever way people come to me, I will reciprocate accordingly. Bhasma Surin has come with ego. Bhasma Surin has come to chase Bhagavan Shiva. Bhagavan Shiva says, all right, for your pleasure, I will run as you are free. For your pleasure, I will run too, as though afraid. My role as Mahadeva and Disney lies not to destroy you, Bhasma. My role is to give you the fruits of your actions, to give you the fruits of your tapasya. So you have come to me with ego, I will allow you to enjoy this ego for a little bit. So Bhagavan Shiva, he runs. And Bhasma Asuri chases him. He starts chasing him through the, all the corners of the world until Bhagavan Shiva begins heading to Vaikuntha. He begins heading to Vaikuntha. Now suddenly, along the path, in front of Bhasma Asuri, appears the most beautiful being he has ever laid eyes on. A beautiful lady, dressed in a gorgeous yellow sari. She is wearing earrings shaped like a fish. Around her neck is a garland of forest flowers. She is perfectly bent in three places and she is holding a lotus flower in her hand. I want us to pay attention to the description of this lady. She is dressed in a gorgeous yellow sari. Who wears yellow? 
Pitambara, Lord Krishna. She is wearing earrings shaped like a fish. Who wears earrings shaped like a fish? Lord Hari. Why does he wear earrings shaped like a fish? To represent Matsya Avatar. Around her neck is a garland of flo uh, forest flowers known as Vanamala. Who wears Vanamala? Bhagavan Hari, Lord Vishnu. She is perfectly bent in three places. Three, three Bhanga. Who is called Three Bhanga? Lord Krishna. And in her hands, she is wearing a. Oh, she is holding a lotus flower. Who holds a lotus flower? Bhagavan Vishnu. Bhajo Keshava Hari Mandala Bhajo Keshava Goes. He goes to this 
lady, and he says, oh, princess, who are you? You are the most beautiful maiden I have ever seen. You must be my bride. And so this maiden, whose name is Mohini, she smiles and she says, oh, handsome Asura. Oh, handsome Asura. Now, when our ego is growing, so remember, Bhagavan Shiva, he runs away from us, Asura. Why? To increase an ego. You want to have an ego? Go ahead. Whatever we want, Bhagavan will give us. You want to grow your ego? Okay, fix up. Mohini too. She is also feeding the flames. Oh, handsome Asura. You certainly seem like a powerful god. Tell me, can you dance? So Bhasma Asura is confused by this question. I just ask you to be my bride, you asking me if I can dance? Tama, did Nicole ask you that when you proposed? Let me find out first if you can dance and then I'll answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bas Master is confused, he says, dance? So Mohini, she says, yes, I love to dance. I love to dance. And she says, I have taken a vow. I have made a sun cup. That I will only marry somebody who can dance as well as I can. You have to see a dance off later, right? I can only marry someone who can dance as well as I am. So Basmasur, he said, yes, I am a great dancer. I am a dancer so great unlike the world has ever seen before. I am the greatest dancer. So Mohini says, oh really? She says, well, let me see your moves. Let me see your moves. And let me see if you can match my moves. And if you can do so, then I will be your bride. If you can do so, then I will be your bride. So Mohini starts to dance. She starts to do some cut up moves. Basma is following. Everything she's doing, he is following. And so she is dancing, she's doing this pretty light bulb move. He is doing it. Everything Bas uh, Mohini is doing, Bas Masur, he is becoming more and more intoxicated because he is looking at this three banga form, this beautiful form bent perfectly in three places, performing all of these beautiful movements. And his desire is increasing, and he is becoming totally intoxicated. No longer is there any sense of judgment. No longer is there any sense of common sense. All he knows is that he must dance exactly as Mohini does so that he can win her to be his bride. And so Mohini, she continues dancing and cluelessly bus Masu, he is following. Until Mohini, she takes her hand and she places it on top of her head. And without thinking, Bhasma Asur, he takes his hand and he places it on top of his head, allowing his desire to overcome good sense. And instantly it is said that his head is shattered as though struck by lightning and he burns into ashes. Now Mohini, assuming her original form as Lord Hari, she calls Mahadeva. She says, oh Mahadeva, my lord, how wicked this man has been. And listen to what she says. How wicked this man has been killed by his own sinful reactions. A lot of times we like to say, well, Bhagavan tricked Basma Asur, and that is why he died. Bhagavan Krishna tells us in Bhagavad Gita, I am not the dua. I made the system, system of law and effect of action and reaction. We will reap the fruits of our own actions. I am not the do not blame me. Do not say Bhagavan did it. Actions have consequences. Basmasu performed an action. He died as a result of his own consequences. She says, look at this wicked man who has been killed by his own sinful reactions. He has destroyed himself. He has destroyed himself. Why? Because of ego, 
because of desire coming together. She says, indeed, what living being can hope for good fortune? Good fortune in the form of Mohini. Mohini who is not different from Bhagavan Vishnu. Who? Oh, who? Who is his companion? Lakshmi Devi. What living being can hope for good fortune if he offends exalted saints? What to speak of offending you, the Lord of the universe? Hari is saying, Mr. Hara. If somebody offends a good person, they cannot be saved. What to say of somebody who offends you, O oh Lord of this universe, O oh Jagat Pita? And so, Bhagavan Shiva, he returns to Kailash. What are the lessons behind our simple kata tonight? Whenever we allow our ego to get so big that we forget, first of all, who is the source of our power? Where does Basmasur go to get his power? He goes to Bhagavan Shiva. He knows where the power lies. Where does he get it from? He gets it from Bhagavan Shiva. But he takes that same power and he becomes so arrogant that he thinks, let me destroy. Now I want to be the destroyer. Let me destroy. So when we forget who is the source of our power, our power to do anything, we begin making decisions that are based on poor judgment. And we see a series of poor decisions made by Basmasu that lead to his destruction. When our ego becomes so big that we forget who Bhagavan is, when our egos become so big that we say, I want to be Bhagavan. I want to be the most powerful. How will Bhagavan respond to that? He will run away from us and not allow us to catch him. The bigger our ego, the further Bhagavan will run. Not because he's afraid of us, but because nobody wants to be around anybody with a big head. Nobody wants to be around anybody who is all about me, me, me. They call that narcissism. Nobody wants to be around that kind of person. So even Bhagavan, when we think of him and when we go to him, he will come. When we start saying, oh, look, I have made Bhagavan come. Me, look at the good tapas we I I have made Bhagavan come. He will run away. He will not stay around us. Bhagavan will allow us to go as far as we want to see the extent of our intentions. He allows Basmasur to fully express the extent of what he wants to do. So he will allow us to go as far as we want to go, but not for as long as we want to do it. Everything has an end. Hari and Hara are non-different. Hari and Hara are non-different. And so many times when we hear this kata, we hear that Hari comes, Bhagavan Vishnu comes to save Hara. He comes to save Bhagavan Shiva. When we look at it from a different perspective, when we go deeper into this, into this kata, into this example, we, re we must remember the phrase that a problem cannot be solved at the same level at which it was created. Have you heard that before? A problem cannot be solved at the same level at which it was created. Bhagavan Shiva and Bhagavan Hari are one and the same. Bhagavan Shiva gives this boon to Basma Asur. But not even what Hari comes. He doesn't manifest as what Hari. He manifests as Mohini. Because that is the lens through which the problem can be solved. So when we create a problem, in order to solve that problem, we must take a different perspective. We must take a different lens. If we look at the problem in the same way that we looked at it when we created it, we're going to be stuck. So Bhagavan Shiva, who is the Lord of the universe, he says, okay, I gave this bonus Shiva, now let me solve it as Mohini. Because that is what is required for the problem to be solved. Another lesson. When we go astray, it is not Bhagavan who will destroy us, Ravi. It's not Bhagavan who will destroy us. We destroy our own selves. We destroy our own selves through poor judgment. Through thinking that we are different than we are. It is not that we are not good. 
we are sparks of divinity, we are sparks of Bhagavan, so we are all good. But when we start believing, I am Guna. <laughs> I am better than Bhagavan. I can outsmart Bhagavan. I can trick Bhagavan. That will lead to our own destruction. So we must catch a hold of our ego and recognize who is the doer and who is the creator of the doership and the source of all the power. The source of everything is none other than Bhagavan. And so when we recognize this grace in our lives and remind ourselves of who and where our life comes from, we will have better judgment. And in so doing, we will stay away from the path of self-destruction. If we are a little demon, or we have little demonic qualities, let us use that as a sign to say, okay, I'm not a very good demon, let me try something else. Rather than trying to perfect our demonhood, like Vrakasur, who became Bhasma Asur, which became a pile of ashes. Umapati Mahadevaki Jai.